So good afternoon. I hope people had a great lunch and you have coffee <laughs> for the afternoon. Uh, my name is Chen Shu Zhou. I'm an assistant professor here at Penn teaching in uh, cinema media studies. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, moderating this afternoon's uh, roundtable, which is also our uh, final roundtable, um, but we, we have a, a other talks afterwards. And this roundtable is titled Exporting Global Nationalisms. Uh, so I will uh, briefly introduce our four speakers in the order of their appearance. Uh, my introduction will be very brief and I encourage people to go to the website for this awesome uh, symposium to uh, look at their full bios. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you. First of all, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I'm really glad uh, that I'm here. Um, I'm sure that uh, you all have noticed uh, the proliferation of Cold War frameworks uh, in contemporary popular media. Uh, so <clears throat> the general ideas here are to investigate the reasons uh, behind this abundance of Cold War themes, also to explore how local Eastern European productions utilize historical narratives to criticize contemporary authoritarian tendencies in the region, all wrapped up in a uh, global transnational uh, formatting and OTT production, productions, uh, and also obviously the overlaps between uh, populism and uh, popular media. This is a part of a bigger research project, so I obviously won't uh, elaborate uh, all of these uh, subjects, and I try to be as quick as it possible and as my eight minutes um, let me. So uh, in the recent years, there has been an emerging uh, interest in Eastern Europe, um, public and scholarly interest as well, and uh, more recently, uh, the more tragic event, Russia's invasion in Ukraine put the, the region into limelight. Uh, also, a relatively recent um, phenomenon is uh, scholarly, are there scholarly debates on the legacy of the, of the 98 uh, transitions, which uh, usually has been seen as uh, success stories, and now uh, they are being seen as a more complex um, stories uh, in, in the context of the democratic processes uh, in the regions. And also this uh, emerging interest is accompanied, accompanied by uh, these aforementioned Cold War theme public media products. Um, just a few quick examples. I'm gonna try this cool, um, uh, yeah, okay. So uh, Comrade Detective, a global production produced by Channing Tatum. I think it came from a place of goodwill, but it's actually, it's awful to watch. Uh, set in 1980s Romania under the Ceausescu dictatorship. It's really, it's, it's, a, it's a failure. Uh, a local production um, called The Sleepers, it's an espionage thriller set in, during uh, the Velvet Revolution uh, in Prague uh, from HBO Czech Republic, also from HBO Czech Republic, Burning Bush, uh, which is a fictionalized story of Jan Palach, uh, the, the student who committed uh, self-information in order to protest uh, the, uh, the uh, occupation of Prague uh, in uh, 68 by the Warsaw Pact troops. Uh, Umbre from uh, HBO Romania, uh, Pact uh, from Poland, Aranielet um, means golden light from HBO Hungary. Um, yeah, I think... Um, yeah, it works. It's amazing. Uh, that, I think this one we uh, we all familiar with Chernobyl, uh, which uses a westernized image of uh, the region. I think that is. I, I will refer it as the most um, postcolonial. Uh, it has the most postcolonial tone of all, all. I think all the series. And my two uh, examples, uh, 1983 from Netflix Poland, actually directed by Agnieszka Holland, acclaimed um, Polish uh, art house film director, and the informant uh, from HBO's Hungary, uh, which uh, I will uh, get back later. So this is just a few quick examples. We have more examples, but I don't have more time. 
to, uh, to this example. So the content of this research. Um, why do we need to talk about Eastern Europe, which is, uh, I think, I just touched it. It's really obvious. What I might highlight is the relationship between post-colonialism and post-socialism. So many scholar, uh, scholars argued that um, post-socialist state is somewhat similar as a post-colonial state. And so we should infuse uh, regional and area studies uh, of Eastern Europe and socialism and post-socialism with general ideas of post-colonialism. Uh, and this is not wrong, so it's not untrue. But also, I think we have to address, and I will address, uh, one of the most important issues about this re research, which is Eastern Europe has a serious race problem. And this race problem has at least two sides. So on one hand, there's a structural racism that is trending towards Eastern European in Western Europe, which is still intact uh, since the Cold War ended. Uh, this is intact, just like the geographical hierarchies are intact. Just, uh, you know, just uh, the most famous example is actually the Brexit campaign, which was partly built on uh, racism towards Eastern European, um, the unbearable whiteness of the Polish plumber as a uh, Hungarian-born uh, sociologist uh, sociologist uh, Jozef Burtz uh, put it. And the other um, side of the problem that Eastern Europeans are ignoring uh, the structural racism and they are completely unburdened by white guilt because in Eastern Europe people say that, okay, so we didn't have colonies. We were not part of the, uh, of the colonial story, so we have no, responsi no responsibilities whatsoever. And this is a very dangerous idea, and it also, this idea is enforced by populist, right-wing, authoritarian, liberal, <laughs> and so on, leaders of the region. And of course, it's a hotbed for violent white nationalism uh, in the region. So this is uh, an important, uh, I think it's an important addition uh, when we are talking about the parallels uh, between post-colonialism and post-socialism, and it also, um, raises the question of self-colonization because most of these Eastern European productions are using these westerns, westernized projections of socialism, state socialism, and Eastern Europe being a, you know, a gritty, joyless, gray, um, sad place, which is not entirely true. Um, so uh, these are the most important uh, contents. And uh, we have another important issue to, uh, to add, which is the obvious overlap between populism and popular media, which is not an Eastern European problem. This is a global problem, obviously. Uh, but I think it's very curious that these uh, Eastern European television series that are using state, state socialist settings to address contemporary issues, like um, uh, surveillance problems, uh, social anxiety, uh, and so on. So they are sort of clashing in a narrative and a symbolic level as well. The traditional power techniques of the socialist dictatorship with the new ways of surveillance technique and the new modes of post-panoptic surveillance. And it also highlights, uh, you know, the, the anomalies of, uh, of uh, platform imperialism because people are watching uh, really popular series and OTT platforms about spying, about surveillance, about social anxiety, about dictatorships, uh, and they are willingly share their personal data with these corporations, which plays, uh, which play the biggest part uh, in contemporary, uh, you know, surveillance and industrial spying. So this is also a very important element. And now my three uh, quick example. Uh, 1983, the first Polish Netflix original, as I mentioned, it, well, the first three episodes was directed by Agnieszka Holland, um, who's, a, who's a pretty famous uh, Polish uh, auteur director. Uh, this is, there is another thing um, to, to add about this series, that they are exploiting and representing uh, a very hybrid generic repertoire. So for example, 1983, sets in a fictional Poland in 2003. Uh, 
Uh, and in the series, communism never fell. So the Iron Curtain is intact, and there is communism in Poland, still communism in Poland. Um, the President of the United States uh, is Al Gore for some strange reason. It remains unexplained, mostly. Um, <laughs> So this is basically an alternative history dystopian Eastern European noir. Um, and it, as I mentioned, it clashes the classic elements of uh, dictatorship and panoptic surveillance, just as you know, school indoctrination, archives, and uh, uh, state police with new technologies uh, in a series. The most popular device is an iPhone-like uh, uh, device. Uh, of course, uh, the state is following every citizen through this uh, device, and I think um, this quote from the series is really telltaling how it criticizes these contemporary authoritarian tendencies. Um, the, the visual word of the series is also, it's really grim um, and, and dystopic. The informant from Hungary, it um, was one of the biggest hits in Hungary last year. Um, it's uh, a story of a college kid who is blackmailed into spying on his classmate at the university, um, who is the leader of the opposition. It takes uh, place in mid-80s uh, mid Hungary. Uh, and it's actually a coming-of-age dramedy espionage thriller. And it debated a series, uh, it sparked serious debates uh, on authenticity and historical agency in Hungary between historians, audiences, uh, film scholars, and members of the former democratic opposition uh, of the 80s. Um, so it's really, it's a curious piece, and it also generates something that Marianne Hirsch uh, calls post-memory, uh, which is how a traumatic historical event uh, is being remembered by later generation. And my last example, and I will finish it uh, now, this is my very recent example, The King, which is the story of a, hang a very popular Hungarian pop, pop singer. Uh, and it also leads to us the production sites uh, of uh, this research, because HBO, as you, uh, I'm sure you all know, uh, have, uh, have hold original productions in Europe. And now, for example, HBO Hungary's creative team just transferred to RTL Hungary, which is a German corporation. And uh, the first quality television series was premiered this December about this, uh, this guy. The, the real version is on your left. And uh, the fictional version is on your right. The, the younger and the older, uh, Jimmy. It, he was called Jimmy by his fans. So I think the series did justice to him big time. Uh, so thank you so much. And um, yeah, that's the end. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank the organizing team for this wonderful event. I'm happy to be here. So I examined the Netflix show, Squid Game, moving from the textual to the contextual level. At the textual level, I first characterized the remote island where the games take place as a, a heterotopia in Michel Foucault's terms, which means a counterplace that reflects or even subverts the rest of the world. The island allegorizes the capitalist world, pretending to correct its inequalities through a fair contest. However, the rules of the games allow for anomalous possibilities, which the game organization uses to ensure only one winner while exerting extrajudicial biopower to kill the rest of the participants. This state of exception emerges through all six official games and also six pseudo games I want to focus on. The first official game, Red Light, Green Light, seems the fairest because everyone starts from the same line and can pass the finishing line for themselves without comparing with others, competing with others. But the crucial condition that elimination means death is not pre-announced in order to cause a massacre. The second game, Popki, the random but fatal choice of one of the four mothers suggests that fair competition is inherently skewed. Likewise, the free choice of a team in the third game, tug of war, depends on luck and power. 
In the fourth game of Barbers, the key to victory is chance and cheating tactics, not adherence to the rules. The fifth game of crossing the glass bridge provokes teamwork and team division, hostile symbiosis and accidental annihilation at once. The final game, the final eponymous squid game embodies the winner take all ideology in a one on one battle of death and destruction on the bare natural ground. The pseudo games also play out the biopolitical laws and exceptions. For example, after the first official game, survivors vote democratically on whether to continue the game, but the last voter who breaks a 50-50 split turns out to be the creator of the game, a supralegal sovereign who can transcend the laws of the game. The midnight killing spree is another pseudo game where the hungry players turn into pseudo sovereign agents who serve the system's goal of reducing the number of players. An unfair uh, anarchic state with no rules is an anomalous contingency tolerated by the system. Later, three survivors are given a knife at a fancy dinner, tacitly encouraged to pro prove that humans can kill competitors even when no longer hungry. The creator seems to have dis the designed the games to test human behavior, psychology, and ethics in extreme dilemmas, thereby proving bestiality as a natural part of humanity and the capitalist mindset as most suitable for this human nature. The last pseudo game involves betting on whether someone will save a homeless man who is freezing to death. The creator of the game, who believes that there will be no such salvation, advises the winner of the game, Ki Hoon, who feels a sense of ethical debt to the dead in the games, to enjoy his prize money as the successful result of his luck and effort. In this respect, the heterotopic game topia functions as a void in the real world system, exceptional to its laws, law and ethics, yet necessitated by its biopolitics and economy. At the same time, the rules and anomalies inherent in any game reflect the rules and anomalies and laws and exceptions of reality. I thus call the game island a reflexive heterotopia that alleg uh, allegorizes the entire world in which this exceptional game land is, is situated, which means the exception is not actually external to the whole system that it is critical of, apparently. Here, if the rules stand for the ideal principle of a liberalist fair competition, the anomalies represent the realities of the current capitalist system, including its neoliberal contingency, unfairness, self-reliance, free for all, and winner-take-all aspects. In this double structure, the game performs the ideology of reality more brutally than reality does, justifying its inevitability by attributing it to human nature. There is no need to worry about the abnormality or bestiality involved in this performance. It's so human, so embrace it. That is uh, what the creator of the games uh, advises. Of course, uh, as the ending suggests, uh, season two of Squid Game, if made, which is actually is made now, will show Gi Hoon disrupting the game organization. But no scenario may escape the ultimate predicament. The reality he will return to will remain the same, except that a game space unknown to everyone else has disappeared like a mirage. The same capitalist system as we know it, as he knows it, will thus reappear as the best option for everybody, everyday life at the finale of the Squid Game series. Here I draw attention to the contextual level of global media culture that celebrates, co-opts, recycles, or recreates the very dark text critical of the system. That is, this media culture playfully normalizes the very exceptional text. Um, Indeed, upon its release, Squid Game became a game that could be played in the real world, as evidenced by endless memes and parodies, analysis and reaction videos, imitations and variations, and costume plays and Dalgona candies. Squid Game also opened a discursive space where, that various uh, groups of people and positions sought to appropriate while discussing related issues such as the global boom of Korean dramas, soft power and cultural hegemony, streaming services and the platform economy, the show's graphic violence and its educational impact and the like. 
Two contradictory political tendencies are especially noteworthy. One is to use the style of the show to expose and educate about the problems of capitalism actively or to re, uh, mobilize public opinion on spe uh, specific issues. So, for example, protesters wear Squid Game costumes for union activities or environmental rallies. The other tendency is to diminish, marginalize, or outright refute Squid Game's critique of capitalism. Ben Shapiro's style, right-wing reactions to le uh, lead to historical and ideological debates about the superiority of capitalism over socialism, even though socialism is never mentioned in the show. More importantly, this cinematic critique of capitalism is enabled and structured by the cultural industry rooted in the capitalist system of globalization. One may remember the bizarre scene of the Netflix CEO wearing the abject Squid Game pro protagonist's black tracksuit uh, track uh, uh, track and smiling like a jubilant child at his $283 billion company's quarterly earnings interview. The streaming media giant's stock price rocketed, thanks, rocketed thanks, uh, exponentially, exponentially thanks to the relatively cheaply produced local dramas globally appealing harsh critique of capitalism. Shortly after the release of Bong Joon-ho's smash hit Parasite, Squid Game became another global Korean product that manifested the performative self-contradiction of the capitalist market, capitalizing on anti-capitalist culture and vice versa. This paradoxical feedback loop of mutual benefits underlies today's cultural survivalism. Moreover, while Parasite demonstrated the performative self-contradiction of today's auteur cinema through the recognition of the traditional authority, such as the Cannes and Academy Awards, Squid Game hit the capitalist jackpot with the most anti-capitalist content by dominating the global supply chain of Netflix from the start. Media content can now depict capitalistic catastrophes more cinematically by depending more financially on the capitalist system. Conversely, this system can reinforce, reinforce itself more powerfully by embracing and investing in such critical content more benevolently. In sum, Squid Game showcases the expansion of this contradictory entanglement with global media capitalism that even takes advantage of global crises such as polarization, debt crisis, and the pandemic, which boosted people's consumption of the OTT services instead of movie going. If this is a cultural new normal, we could expect to see even more films and dramas reflecting how our lives are threatened by the global system on the one hand, and to notice such cinematic content reproduced by post-cinema media corporations embodying the very same system on the other. But we cannot anticipate how long this uh, productive contradiction will perform itself, and if or when it might reach a tipping point of self-explosion or self-transformation. At least one thing is sure. Dynamic contingency and unknown anomalies mobilize both the capital system and the cr cultural, uh, critical culture in such a convoluted feedback loop. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Nan Song, I'm the last one. I'm glad to follow the three amazing presentation and introduce my research. From the spiritual pain to the internet addiction, the digital drag discourse of video games in the 1990s and 2000s in China. The growth of video games industry in China during this period led to the concern about the foreign ideology and the game addiction resulting in the stigmatization of video games as a form of a digital drug. So this, uh, this discourse changed from the special pain to the internet addiction, reflecting the power dynamic, <coughs> nationalism, anti-drug campaigns, and the video game involutions in China. The current research on the stigmatization of uh, the games usually use a moral panic theory to study a single metaphor or label, uh, such as the speech opinion or the internet addiction, uh, which, uh, which ignores the interpretation of the variation between the labels. So using 
the historical and cultural methodology. Uh, this study tries to explore how the digital drug discourse in the video games evolved in the 1990s and 2000, and how it was mutually constructed with the video game industry in China. The spiritual PM uh, refers to the arcades and the console games in the 1990s. In China, opium was regarded as one of the culprits of the China's decline and humiliation since the Qing Dynasty. So this discourse represents the concern not only about the health, but also the national destiny. So at the beginning, the mainstream media established the correlation between the negative effects and the pathological symptom of the video games and the drug use. So many official newspapers, including the People's Daily, Guangming Daily, described uh, the negative effects of the addiction to the video games, including the product unproductivity, uh, safety crime, the damage to the personal health. In the 1996, the Guangming Daily and People's Daily report uh, some Chinese employees refused to participate in, a, uh, in the production of a game, a Japanese game, that obscured the facts of Japanese military aggressions, so which was called the Glorious Four Gentlemen Incident. The Guangming Daily be, uh, believed that the Western political view and uh, value permits the video games, which exert a negative influence on Chinese teenagers. The digital game uh, market during this period was dominated by the foreign, uh, foreign games, especially from the Japan and the United States, which had obviously ideological conflicts with China. So the concern about the games are no longer the technical or social, but the political and ideological. So at this stage, a large number of the local government closed down the street arcades, and a large number of the boycotts the propaganda activities were held in the elementary school and middle school. So you can see uh, there's a picture. Yeah, yeah. It's about, yeah, so many, at that time, many schools allowed their, to, uh, their students to sign on you know, the post of the, uh, like the see goodbye video games like that. And the electronic heroin was labeled to the PC games in the uh, late 1990s and the early 2000s. The electronic, uh, electronic heroin discourse evolved from the spiritual PM, signifying the increased harm and the tendency of the de-ideologizations. Uh, the heroin was a new drug from the Eastern and the Southern Asia's. Yunnan Province Public Security Department pointed out that in the 1998, one of the drug use tendency uh, was from the opium smoking to the heroin smoking. So from the spiritual pain to the electronic herring, the computer games have become more harmful, and there, was, uh, there has been a de-ideologization of the critic of the games. At that time, although the Chinese government continued to crack uh, down the street arcades, uh, computer game house, uh, by, by, by the time, uh, a lot of the computer house, game house emerged, and crimes related to uh, gaming increased. As a result, in the mainstream media, the potential threat to the society was greater, and the harm of the electronic games was increasing. So which contributes to the upgrade from the opium to the heroin? After the Four Gentlemen incident in Tianjin in 1996, the Chinese game companies started uh, to produce the games, promoting the patriotism and the traditional uh, Chinese cultures. To some extent, it is seen the social concern about the ideology of the games. The de-ideologizations of the games at this time come from the two aspects. The first, uh, due to the government, the in inability to completely eradicate the illegal arcades and computer, games, uh, computer game houses, even after a large scam cleanup and mobilizations. The mainstream narratives began to weaken its emphasis on the ideology in the game industry in order to avoid the suspicion of the system and ideology. The second, the democratically uh, produced games that promotes the patriotism and the traditional uh, Chinese culture with the scene of the Chinese history and war began to gain the popularity in the market using the social concern about the ideology of the games. The online game was called the Internet Addictions uh, the internet addiction discourse marked uh, de drugification of the games and the transfer of the responsibility from the government to the society. 
the government began support uh, supporting the online games industry to boost the uh, economy and the information industry based on the Korean experience. The so mainstream media started to call uh, the online game as an emerging industry, emphasizing, uh, emphasizing its positive promotion of the uh, economy, especially the information industry, instead of uh, calling it the digital drug. So that's the government is freed from the responsibility of the completely eradicating them. So however, at the same time, how to, there's questions, how to uh, explain the reported criminal or the negative incidents related to the gaming. So in the mainstream, uh, it, it causes the internet addictions. They regard it as a kind of the psychological problem instead of the social problem or pol uh, political problems. So in this way, they transferred the, uh, the responsibility from the government to the individuals and the family. So, uh, so that's the internet addiction. Experts emerge to help the family or individuals to get, uh, get over the internet addictions. So using the historical and cultural methodology, this article finds that the shift from the spiritual pain to the internet addiction represents uh, uh, depoliticalization and the de-ideologizations of the discourse, as well as the uh, transfer of the responsibility from the state to the individuals. Overall, this article also provides an understanding of the influence of the digital drug discourse on the Chinese game industry and try to contribute to a broader conversation about how the authoritarian government consolidated uh, their authority authority and intervene the people's uh, layered time through the stigmatization of video games and how the post-socialist state responds to the foreign imported uh, uh, game uh, media technology. Yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you. We're a little bit behind on time, so um, I'll limit myself to maybe one uh, pretty broad question, and I'll open it up to the audience for, for questions. And if there's more time, I may be able to throw in another question. So um, thank you so much for, uh, for all these like, really interesting and diverse discussions. I, I would like to relate your papers to the panel's theme, uh, which was brilliantly titled Exporting Global Nationalism. Uh, not that I feel like all the paper uh, talk about exporting nationalism, but what's interesting <coughs> is precisely how each of your paper, to me, problematized this theme in different ways and highlights different aspects of this. So I want to give you my understanding and then end with an actual question. Um, so for Nisark's paper, uh, it's really interesting that what you're discussing is a case of exporting nationalism, but somehow the nationalism gets lost in the process of circulation in the transnational stage, right? So for um, non-Indian audiences, the, the in ideology, nationalist ideology, uh, didn't become translatable. So, so it becomes spectacle and stereotypes that get foregrounded. So it raises the question of uh, translatability or uh, to use the term here, like exportability, right? whether it's nationalism can be exported. And then for uh, Veronica, uh, what's in it really interesting is the examples you talk about, they are locally developed but globally circulated shows. Um, what I find really interesting, I guess, is the question of the role of uh, the platform or the production company in this. Um, who is doing the exporting, right, for work purposes? Because it seems like the main agent we're thinking about, right, HBO Hungary or HBO Europe, what kind of role uh, these um, like big firms are playing in here. And then, uh, and then for uh, Sam Hung, uh, your case is interesting because on the surface it seems like Squid Game is very global. Where is the nationalism in this, right? Is there no Koreanness that we should talk about in relation to Squid Game? Is it really uh, as global as it presents itself to be? And then for uh, uh, Nan Xiong, who talks about uh, changing discourses of video games in China. Um, uh, I, I think in addition to the uh, drug metaphors you, you mentioned, I think maybe um, it didn't come off as, as much as it, in the presentation as in the paper, it's about the role of a uh, changing discourse of nationalism. Right, whereas with opium, there was uh, this interpretation of uh, kind of foreign influences that need to be uh, fended off. 
Um, but later on, there was more attention to gaming as a national industry that needs to be develop developed. So again, in this case, um, I don't really think we see a case of exporting nationalism. But precisely in the absence of that, right? It, it's interesting um, that I feel it occasions the question that why there is an incentive to export nationalism in the first place, and in what circumstances would an, an entity being a, a state or a platform be interested in actively exporting nationalism? I think everyone of us can, can think about it. And I also find it interesting uh, that uh, we're talking about global nationalisms here. I, I haven't touched on the term global, which is very central for our symposium. But for global nationalism, <coughs> it seemed to suggest a kind of de-globalization, that we're kind of going into a period of uh, populism, right, protectionism, the rise of different kinds of right wing <laughs> conservatism or nationalism. So with all these uh, Considered, I guess the question I would like you to respond to is this one. Uh, how important is the nation, nation state still in the story of global media circulation that you are all trying to tell? Uh, what role does the nation state play? And what about the role of uh, the region, maybe both at a supranational level, right, thinking about Eastern Europe as a region, or maybe uh, at a, a level that's below the nation, maybe like regionalism within India. So um, just generally the role of nation state. Mm -hmm. And then I would like to invite you to each respond whenever you're ready. Think, Whoever is ready, yeah. yeah I, can, first. I can go and let me know if it's not audible because um, I'm not sure how this works. Um, I think one of the crucial concept or aspect that we need to, that needs thinking and that we need seriously need to reconsider is the question of, um, before we come to questions of nationalism, the, the status of nation state, mm. as it gets imbricated within this like very transnational circuits. And it seems to me, and this is my primary proposal, a hypothesis, that as soon as you uh, interrogate nation state not as a uh, either as a formed stable category of thinking of politics but as soon as we make that category a little bit shaky um, many things open up and in terms of our discussion today it seems to me what media or transnational circulation of media does it, it shows you how precisely within this circuits of translation of transmission getting lost or not getting lost, the messages or ideology, um, the nation state itself gets both reconfigured, and this is not to make a statement of what kind of reconfiguration that is, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, what is the status of nation state in post-coloniality, that's a huge topic, I'm sidelining that right now. Uh, but anyways, uh, so as soon as we start paying attention to the circulation and precisely to the circulations of, of, um, of ideology, of messages, of nation state, um, it seems to me that there is something that to be gained precisely in terms of what is the new phase of nationalism. Because it clearly is not the nationalism that coming from very kind of uh, situated South Asian background, it is not a nationalism that was operational, it seems to me, uh, even in like early 2000s. Uh, something is happening. And I leave that question of what that something is. Uh, this then brings me to the, the, the first question that you asked of uh, nationalism getting lost. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe I would just like tweak this question a bit and instead of saying getting lost as someone who comes from a uh, literary background, instead of like thinking about messages getting lost, it seems to me uh, to introduce the question of like translatability or mistranslation, it's something is to be gained in terms of like what kind of translation happens to nationalist ideology. Mm -hmm. um, and I say this uh, with two quick examples. One of was in New Jersey, uh, in, um, where, um, where there was a rally, there was like very much of a um, Hindu, uh, very kind of, um, it was clad with saffron, the rally was very much kind of, it seemed like a Hindu nationalist. Uh, they brought out bulldozers for the fellow South Asianist in the, in, the, in the room, and everyone knows about this. But uh, again, the thing is like, what happens to nationalism with diaspora? And I don't do diaspora studies, so I'm not touching that. <laughs> but yes. I can continue. So as of the first question, the role of OTT platforms, 
I think there are two parallel paradigms uh, in Eastern Europe and in, in Europe um, as the whole. So one thing is the withdrawal of HBO, um, mm -hmm. which was the decision of last year. Um, and curiously enough, there were theories that this is another power exercise or some sort of uh, oppression against uh, Eastern Europe again. So this is a obviously it's a ridiculous. It was a ridiculous contemporary th uh, conspiracy theory, but it I mean it existed. Uh, it then turned out that HBO um, hold all HBO Europe original productions. Um, so this obviously is it's going to rewrite um, the the production map. But the other important element of the production map of Eastern Europe that um, is actually um, it, it's very imp it's a very important um, um, setting for runaway productions, global runaway productions, uh, which um, you know which strengthens this geopolitical hierarchy because. Uh, so Netflix and other global conglomerates and corporations, they are bringing the production to Eastern Europe, where uh, you know, they, uh, they get tax cuts from illiberal nationalist governments. So nationalism, obviously, in populist politics is just a masquerade. So they're getting tax cuts. Um, below the cut workers are, you know, cheaper as in Western Europe or in the United States. So this is a very, it's a cultural colonization of the region again and again. Um, and of course it doesn't hurt that Eastern European capitals like Budapest, Prague, um, they can, you know, pose this as uh, European cities, as Paris, as, and, and so on and so on. So um, it's, uh, it's really easy place to, uh, to shoot series. So this is absolutely uh, a colonization mm -hmm. of the region, region through production in, you know, in the disguise of, um, of an economical uh, or an, an economic boost. Uh, and this goes against nationalism as well. Um, if I, I, I don't do production studies. If you're interested in the, in the topic, uh, Professor Anna Coimbra, I'm sure that you've heard of her, just recently published a paper on Netflix's Witcher uh, and uh, illiberal fantasies of whiteness and, and um, centered around this problem of runaway productions of Eastern Europe. So I think this is going to be a hot topic for, for the next uh, years or so. As of the nation state, well, so, it's really interesting because everyone can talk about the nation state as they know it. So in Europe and in Eastern Europe, obviously the nation state is a construction uh, as, as everywhere. But for example, in Hungary, the, the idea of the nation state and political, not just cultural, but political nationalism uh, has roots in, um, in literature, in, in fictional literary works of the early 19th century which transformed into really violent forms of political nationalism uh, from the First World War, actually. And now I think what is curious in Europe that how the, the war is going to, um, to change the foundations of the nation states and uh, how I think hopefully the European Union can um, you know, show an uh, as you as you as you said it as you put it a supranational alternative mm -hmm. of course um, these mentioned the liberal populist um, leaders like Hungary's uh, awful Viktor Orban uh, his government is pro-Russian uh, and also they are pro-nation states so they are against basically against the foundations of the European Union which is I think super dangerous and very alarming um, so these populist leaders will always say that the nation state has to live on in order to, to preserve national cultures, but we all know that, that this is not how it goes. So I think this, the, I don't know when the war ends, but this is going to change. The, na the state of the nation state and the phenomena of the nation state all through Europe and especially in Eastern Europe, because the war is in our neighborhood. Yes, uh, as you saw, actually my talk was not about nationalism, so uh, the panel title doesn't really perfectly fit into my own uh, agenda. 
Uh, but then, uh, you know, I can still discuss uh, what is the what is the nationalism, or if, if there is anything like that in Squid Game. And at least uh, two levels, uh, I could address that. Uh, again, as I did in my, my talk, you know, on the textual level, uh, everything that you saw in the series uh, happens in the nation of Korea. Though Koreanness itself doesn't matter too much, right? Uh, it's really about the global capitalist condition in which everybody has to you know, compete with each other, not in a fair you know, contest system. And then there are always inevitably generated losers and then who need a sort of a final chance to get back and uh, to life and so on and so forth. So the, the show sort of fictionally offers a, a kind of, uh, you know, uh, that opportunity to get back to uh, the system uh, through this kind of competition. And that's the thing which can be comparable with so many other countries in terms of the global condition of capitalist life in general. And I think that was the appeal of the show. Uh, and the people enjoyed, regardless of their nationality and you know, uh, language barriers, whatever, you know, they understand the, what's going on there and it can be related to their lives in terms of you know, this global condition, uh, 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 which does not leave any room for you know, being outside. And that is the most important thing. Uh, so I think that was a very successful point. But then of course, on the contextual level, this locality, that could be understood as global itself is always brandized, you know, by the nation state. Of course, you know, the the, the country, uh, the government, and then the, the majority of the Korean people uh, really, in some sense, enjoyed not only the show as the text, but also the whole context in which it was now, you know, kind of celebrated and enjoyed by so many people in the globe. And you know, there are so many parodies and games that wonder uh, that that they enjoyed this kind of thing based on the show here and there. And we watch, you know, how other countries' people react to this show, uh, and that it is well received, and so on and so forth. You know, so in that level, and I actually wanted to uh, point out a certain contradiction here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, the text itself is very critical of the whole global system. While once it is successfully assumed, and then we see it, you know. It's all about celebration. Yeah, we made another big jackpot in cultural media industry uh, after uh, you know, Parasite and something like that too. And then we are proud of that kind of thing, of course. If there's nationalism, there's something like that uh, here. But then I think that this is a little different from uh, any sort of risk, risk, uh, risky nationalism, if you want, uh, in a more reactionary mode. Uh, I think that it's a sort of, you know, uh, how can I say, uh, recognition better that could be found in any other countries. And then at the same time, I would say uh, at least the, the, the government in Korea sort of welcomes any cultural product like this, which is also very critical of the Korean society. So Parasite, as you may have seen, you know, uh, is pretty critical of you know, uh, the whole country's uh, situation about housing and so on and so forth, which means it's about the dark reality. But then the Korean government does not you know, shy away from embracing dark, critical cultural products about the country itself. Uh, and then, of course, it's packaged and then you know, brandized. That's another level. But at the same time, it's not like you know, oh, the government doesn't want to you know, uh, like you know, uh, this kind of uh, content that is critical of the country, which is, in other cases, can be very you know, censored and put aside, right? So it is a little different from other cases in which you know, nationalism is driven by the government in a way of only celebrating its bright side. But rather, this is another, how can I say, globalized nationalism, if you want. So if something that can be appealed to the whole globe regardless of its content, regardless of its potential critique of the whole system or capitalism or nationalism, whatever, the nation is ready to embrace it. Mm. Yeah. So I feel um, RR and um, Squid Game, they form really interesting comparison exactly. with each other because Squid Game seem to just have uh, like the right amount of exoticness to make it novel for a non-Korean audiences, right? Yet at the same time, it doesn't demand a very historicized understanding about any of the cultural mm -hmm. references that appears in the show. So it seems like that transnational market sometimes, it does demand, right? So, something like different, right? From like something national so that it can energize the market through that novelty. Um, and then maybe some of the Eastern European shows have a similar logic behind it. Uh, but the Chinese case, I, I mean, can we talk about yeah. any Chinese culture without talking about the Chinese state, right? That, that gets, I guess it's very different um, from Korea. 
Yeah, uh, due to the time limitation, just I didn't uh, illustrate a lot about national law in my study. And but actually, uh, in the Chinese China's case, we can find the national state or the national leader has a kind of has a. I, I guess in my case, uh, has a two sides uh, or uh, two rules. The first one is to forbidding or the banning the foreign games, the foreign contempts, like uh, before the. 2000s, a lot. Uh, the central government, the government uh, banned the uh, the for uh, worrying about the ideology stuff and the political stuff. So they uh, try to uh, close down a lot of lot of the uh, lots of the street arcades and forbid the playing the uh, importing the uh, game consoles, especially. Uh, the co game console ban uh, lasts for lasts uh, nearly the 14 years. So in the most of the times, um, uh, Chinese player uh, didn't, uh, cannot, ca couldn't not play the games in, uh, le legally, uh, legally uh, at in the society. So as uh, uh, on the other side of the uh, role of the national states is uh, supporting the national uh, games development. Uh, after after at the end of the 1990s and the uh, early of the 2000s, the, the so this, especially after the 2000s, the government government the national states started to support uh, the uh, Chinese uh, game industry. Especially, they launched the national games publishing project to support the Chinese game company to. Uh, publish of uh, around the 100 games in the five years. So in this kind of, we can see, um, but, but in this case, we cannot, when we talk about national state, I find, just in my case, we can, what we found, we ca I, I cannot regard the national state as a, a whole, because we've, we, I found there's, there was a, a lot of the uh, power and political struggle with different the department. Yeah, especially, uh, from the information industry and the cultural industry and the uh, elementary uh, press and publishers. So this is uh, this uh, department has uh, had a, gr a great power structure, a uh, power struggles to um, the, both uh, all of them tried tried to manage the game industry because it was uh, quite the profitable. So, and they also, I also find there is a struggle between the central government and the local government, uh, especially after, if, especially when the, 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 the China started to uh, develop online games. Uh, we can see the, the, the culture industry, uh, the culture, uh, the culture department try to open, try to open their own uh, the chain of the uh, internet cafe. That's this kind of the uh, This kind of activity and the policies was uh, boycotted by the local government. Mm -hmm. So I find um, when we st uh, st when we um, exploring the state in the uh, media industry, find I find I just find the power structures much more complete uh, than I saw it before. Yeah. Yeah, because the uh, game is really situated at this intersection of uh, internet digital culture, but it's also a question of urban governance, right? Because you were talking about tangible spaces of leisure yeah, that people yeah. can go to. So, so that's a whole set of question there. Um, maybe for now, I think let's open it up for uh, questions from the audience. We'll be great on time. Yes, please. Yeah, hi. Um, um, I have a question for um, Nisar. Um, you raise a very interesting point about um, circulation, um, what gets circulated, um, and what is the, like, the capital that, that, that moves and things like that. And you mentioned something about ignorance. Uh, that is really, um, that, that, that was really uh, interesting for me. Um, because um, in this global network of circulation, um, sometimes circulating um, ignorance is also part of the market, right? So people doesn't necessarily need to understand what they consume because it's about consumption. It's not sometimes about um, understanding or consciousness. So could you say more about this idea about ignorance? Could you say more about this idea of like the layers of intersection? 
textuality that that you think is um, boosting this success um, in which of course um, political interest in being part of the uh, global cinema or the global like, cinema industry is at stake so how you how we could think about um, ignorance in this global uh, networks of circulation thank you uh, thanks for the question maybe i should start by saying that one of the reason why I did this like small paper on rrr was because for me i found it baffling how this text is being translated or what are the what are the nodes of its reading in terms of it's it feels very situated in terms of how you read the text itself how you see the movie if you are if you are tamil it speaks to you in a very different language if you are non tamil like me uh and still indian it speaks very differently and i cannot even even imagine i'm, I'm this is like no joke like i don't know how people at oscars were looking at the at the song or like what they thought was very appealing mm -hmm. um because i'm sure like none of the judges are like tamil judges which is to say if the song wins it uh, mm -hmm. and all the other songs were were they they look sorry sorry uh, this is a disaster in south asian studies <laughs> 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 me mixing up uh, tamil and telugu <laughs> speaks to my ignorance but uh, thank you because the same thing can be said about uh, global cinema that comes from indigenous regions of world, like globe mm -hmm. and just uh, okay I'm, i shouldn't be that long but just to quickly say like so one of the things that i find baffling with telugu <laughs> is precisely like if the nodes of text is not being read in the same ways at different points of its uh, of its um, of its um, uh, viewing or reading like where does then how do we read the questions of knowledge itself and this is where the my first point is to say let's treat instead of making a like either um, qualitative or quantitative judgments over the questions of knowledge itself let's read ignorance itself as symptomatically as ignorance that gets produced and will get produced in terms of this global circuits which is to say ignorance itself as a certain kind of part that or an inherent part within which the media circulates as soon as it circulates on a global scale now once we make that move this theoretical move of reading ignorance symptomatically the other thing that i found fascinating was uh, was this uh, new york times uh, critic adlakha who was clearly like say, positioning himself as an insider where he says i took my two american friends with me they were the only two american people in the whole theater and they were like vibing with the thing and I, and then anyways so he, he stages this scene and of course he gets like me between tamil and telugu my disaster <laughs> he also gets duped into thinking like natu natu is nothing it, it it's, it's just about dance and spices and it means nothing which is to say it seems to me that everyone is standing in an ignorant position and this may be first of all is a condition of post coloniality and second of all may be a condition of circulation of text within the global circuits okay uh jing and then okay uh um, so can you hear me yes um i guess i have a question actually for all of the um panelists but from um a single more or less coherent perspective. So I'm curious about a gender perspective and more specifically the masculinity perspective. Because um, in all the presentations, they deal with nationalism and global cultures from different, uh, from different contexts. However, as we all know, um, as a rise of the authoritarianism everywhere in global north and global south, it's deeply and intimately tied to the representation of masculinity in both political and popular cultures. So, uh, for instance, when I was watching Squid Game, it just strikes me how masculine, you know, those games are. And although there are a few female characters, like I remember correctly, if, um, that's player number 67, something <laughs> like that, you know, a, a defector from North Korea, you know, who was killed at uh, in the sixth game, I, I can't remember clearly, but you know, there were a few female characters. However, in general, 
it is very masculine, and there are other very popular Netflix shows, you know, um, like the Physical 100. <laughs> I started watching it, although there are a few, again, uh, females at the beginning, but in the end, they all were out, and it, you know, the winner, and later they critiqued it. So, uh, or if we look, watch the RIR, I, I was also struck by the similar tone, as well as even Chernobyl, or if we look at the gaming industry in China, um, if we look at a PC game, like starting from 1990s, there was a League of Legends, a world champion. And in all those games, you see the young boys, you know, talking about how exhausting it is to play the game, but there is a, this brotherhood. I, I wonder, uh, in all of your studies, how do this emergence of those um, media representation as well as like something like a game industry either actually consolidate certain ideas of masculinity or destabilize it? Um, yeah, just curious. Well, basically about Squid Game, I think, yeah, you're right, you know, there was critique about, you know, the gender imbalance uh, depicted in the show, and all the female game players, you know, do not successful, uh, do not succeed in the end, you know, they are all killed, uh, and, and, and there's a limitation, definitely. But I think that, you know, it's also the limitation of uh, the gender status in reality as well. The cinema, you know, cannot simply, like a fake reality in a way that, you know, we are more fair, gender balanced, the world depicted on the screen, okay? If a film represents reality, that also represents the, all the problems of reality as well. So, uh, uh, it's one thing that uh, we can definitely see the limitations of representation in the, in the films, in, you know, dramas or whatever, uh, at the same time, uh, you couldn't demand the cinema uh, for being more progressive than reality as such. And in some sense, it is realistic because, you know, uh, in reality, uh, if there was a game like that, maybe uh, there may be fewer women, you know, than the men who would participate in that kind of physically infused game. So the game structure itself is, yes, a little oriented to masculinity and the power and physical activity self patterns there. And as I say, it's not about the rules. It's all about the deviation from the rules and the exception and anomalies, which involve a lot of masculine tactics and then, you know, their own physical powers and so on and so forth. Which is wrong in reality, but then that's reality. And then in some sense, the, this show represents that kind of thing. So uh, yes, definitely you are right, but at the same time, it's in some sense inevitable. I think at least at this point, we could imagine that that would be a better, you know, gender balanced game. Uh, uh, but at, at least up until this point, this point, you know, in some sense, this masculinity-oriented, action-driven media culture itself is sort of kind of a mainstream, even if problematic. And you can be found doing RLL and whatever action films as well. So yes, it's a pretty much a broad question. Yeah, I also uh, why do my research also notice the gender factor uh, in the Chinese game industry, That's especially in the stigmatization of video games. That's uh, in the 1990s there, even in the 2000s, there's a popular writing style that uh, the mother complain, uh, complain the, uh, complain the 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 digital games to the government about his son. Uh, uh, his son is addi addicted to the video games. So most of the uh, most of the article about the stigmatization of video games, uh, the characters as uh, mother, children. So uh, so there is a, a, a special a specific the stereotype and the uh, gender self. So I was just thinking about uh, mother is uh, complying. Uh, the song is uh, addicting to the video game. So, where is the father? So, in this narr narrative and in this discourse, the government is like the father. So, because uh, the the mother is accompanying uh, their sons to the government, in, in this this kind of newspaper, they also always write uh, the mother beg beg the government to save the children, to save his uh, her sons. Uh, to uh, close down the street arcade or the 
uh, forbid the playing the games like that. So in this kind of narrative, I feel like like that the father, parents, and son like that, the Oedipus stuff. Yeah, I just noticed that. But due to the uh, the data limitations, I didn't uh, collect more about the opinion of the females uh, females players opinions. Yeah, I, I just read a few articles and a letter in the game magazines. They they have the the letter from the uh, players. Some female game uh, female players send the articles to the magazine. Say say they don't have the they, why there is a few games for the girls, why there's no female games. Always about the a warm, always about the fighting. Yeah, so absolutely they they um, consolidate the masculine or the yeah, the structure. And as a stereotype, yeah. Would you like to respond? <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you for the question. So <clears throat> I think nationalism basically is um, the, the constant rebranding of patriarchal genealogy. So it's, um, it's by definition very masculine. And uh, of course these populist authoritarian regimes are trying to annihilate the, uh, and deny you know, the, the results of social sciences and they try to ban gender studies and so on and so on. Um, so I think it's really important to to talk about uh, the seemingly obvious relation between violent nationalism and forms of ex exclusion and and masculinity, um, and also as of um, the the series, uh, it also have a gender agenda. Uh, our research as well. Um, so state socialism was uh, oppressive towards women. Under the flag of uh, equality, you know, all, all people are equal, uh, but uh, it was in theory and it was, of course, the state propaganda. It varied from state to state uh, because socialism is something that we tend to talk about as socialism, but obviously it was different uh, in Hungary uh, where there was a lighter version of state socialism than Romania, uh, where there was a grim dictatorship uh, from from the late 60s or or the Soviet Union itself, obviously. Uh, but it was oppressive towards women, especially in terms of housework and what we now call invisible work. Uh, I'm, I'm doing this recommendation thing again. I don't know why I'm doing this, but um, so there's a, a, there's a fascinating book. Actually, UPenn's own Professor Gotzi wrote a book uh, called Second Word, Second Sex. If someone is interested in this, this topic, um, uh, the gender inequalities in socialist countries. And this series, this contemporary um, series uh, with uh, state socialists and, uh, and communist settings, they are doing a curiously similar thing as we've heard what Downton Abbey uh, does with the colonial past and with the colonial setting of the, uh, of the 19, uh, early, early 20th century Britain. So uh, this some of this series ha has female protagonists, um, and it also, for example, one of the crime series called The Meyer, set in communist Poland, it's about a party official who abused schoolgirls, and he got killed because of this abusive uh, behavior, which obviously was uh, unimaginable during socialism because the term abuse and you know it, it doesn't exist and party officials in many countries could do whatever they want so uh, some somehow these series try to address issues of sexism homophobia racism well, not racism not so much because I mentioned the race problem in Eastern Europe but sexism homophobia for sure and try to do a belated justice um, but it's obvious that they are fictional and they are um, they are watched by contemporaneous audiences, so uh, that's the I, that's the strategy they they use. I'll keep it short. I mean, for the song Natu Natu, if you remember, why does the song take place? Because the two protagonists, the brown two brown men, they wanna show the white man that they cannot dance, and in a certain sense, its whole structure is around like this figure of white woman. Who they wanna? It's like it, it's a fight of uh, of dating and also flight of uh, kind of influencing. 
which happens in an accented version which is to say uh, and this is like an old kind of thing where it's like again the body of woman plays a fulcrum role where the ideological rotates around itself but then um, and this is where uh, instead of being like white man saving brown woman from brown man spivak it's now brown man saving white woman from white man uh, that was a joke um, anyways um, but it also i mean it also reminds me that there is an easy answer which it seems to me okay which is like nationalism written it with the scripts of patriarchy with the scripts of this like very masculine six pack man uh but at the same time it feels to me like it's such an easy cop out of thinking about nationalism um so i'll just put my ignorance out there and i'll stop there yeah uh, we, we don't have we a have lot one, we have one online uh, question mm-hmm. so let's address that and wrap it up quickly we have like 5 more minutes okay um so we have a question from cesar jimenez martinez from uh, cardiff university thanks for the presentation scholars have predicted the death of nations for decades uh why do you think it persists uh, among governments media outputs but also audiences especially if we understand nationalism beyond the narrow popular discourses that equate it with right wing political expressions so open to the panel is there anyone who wishes to take it on well, can we maybe collect, see if there are questions maybe we can collect them all and then just have one round of responses if anyone Karen would just like uh, to ask you uh, maybe, maybe can address this question really quickly because we have like maybe three or okay. four Okay okay Well I think this part of the political efforts the nation state is dead or at least dying for decades uh it's just um somehow it feels like the similar crime of the nation state um you know what is being kept alive by political discourses uh and because all of these transnational and global um you know processes even in countries that denying um the the, the end of or the legacy of uh of this this global um the end of the nation state and the legacy of these global processes i mean you can't really you, you don't find a a nation state as it, it formerly you know existed so i think this nation state is not the same as it was before um you know the great war or even the second world war i'm not sure the question addressed this problem i i didn't quite catch the focus of the question but Let's start with the death of the nation state. So. <laughs> uh, uh, the question is about why do you think it persists among governments, media outputs, but also the audiences? Because of the rhetoric, I think, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not sure I understand correctly. I would um, just keep it short and just say, <laughs> uh, nation state. It seems to me is just like one of the categories, like gender, being man, woman, non-binary, which persist. because of multiple registers within which it operates it's not just either a political register or sociological register but at a certain level and this is where the the french new one or two things about thinking about nation state is uh, is uh, is precisely the way that it interpolates people that it makes subject out of yourself out of whatever the x that we are out of the variable that we are uh which is to say like nation state is dead but also long live nation states yeah yeah basically yeah. that's right that's it well if or if there are no more responses we'll we'll sit with that difficult question and think more about it uh we only have uh 15 minutes till the next plenary session so i encourage people to uh get to your business as soon as you can and come back in 15 minutes thank you so much thank you.